Howdy, and welcome to another episode of Adult Onset Horsemanship. I'm your host, Daniel Dolphin. Good morning and welcome to our February Q&A session. First question that we have reads as follows. Listening to Bruce Sandifer again, since many don't understand a hackamore, can you address that to balancing your horse, perhaps in a snaffle? Uh, I, I think she means compare it to. I tend to get older horses that need to start over and my hackable skills are questionable. Looking forward to more podcasts. A hackamore and a snaffle are similar in that they are the tools that we tend to put young green horses in. They are somewhat different in how they mechanically function, however, and not just because one's in the mouth and one's on the nose. The hackamore is a pretty big influence on me and, and how I view signal. And if you do watch our video, bit, uh, more than a bit of information, the, the comprehensive uh, video on bits and bidding, the, the way that I break signal down in that video is into a signal phase and a leverage phase. The, the reason that I describe it that way is in large part due to how the hackamore works. So I view signal phase as basically everything that happens before either a curb strap comes tight and rotation effectively ends or we compress all of the soft tissues and we really get into what I call hard contact. So that's the way that a snaffle bit works. One of the reasons for that is that a hackamore does work as a lever. And, and here we're talking about traditional hackamores, not mechanical hackamores. That's an entirely different ball of wax. But a traditional hackamore rotates about where the call it a thong uh, or the, the headband, the, the string that goes around the horse's pole that ties into the nose of nose button of the hackamore. That is the center of rotation. So it will rotate forward very slightly with the nose button, but predominantly we have the heel down there below uh, moving back and forth. What Bruce was talking about with regard to the, the feet or not, the feet or not, provides a throat latch for the hackamore, keeps it a little more out of the horse's eyes, but most importantly, it ends some of that rotation. It keeps the heel knot from going as far forward as it would if it were swinging freely. It actually takes a little bit of the signal away from the hackamore, but it does keep the heel knot from going forward and hitting the horse in the chin. Because of the way it frames the hackamore up, the hackamore is partially through rotation and held there. It allows the horse to frame up in such a way where their nose is basically riding inside of a circle. And if they find the, the point of no pressure in that circle, then they will be balanced according to the balance of that particular hackamore. The bit pretty much works the same way. It's the neutral position. So that's what he was talking about in, in framing a horse up with a hackamore. The simplest way to view that is tilt of the horse's head, chin being closer to the chest or further out front, with the vertical being in the most notable singular position of that range. So with a staffle, we have a similar relationship. When a horse learns to pick the bit up and hold it and, and has a good mouth seal and we have a good communication through our hands, we can begin to influence the horse vertically. That being said, to me, the the single greatest use of a snaffle, and particularly a single-jointed snaffle, is to soften a horse laterally. And that's really where I think it's at with those bits. And I really feel like most people fail in terms of lateral flexion. They don't get a horse soft enough laterally, and nine times out of ten, the problems that they have down the road are really rooted in the fact that they haven't done that. And if they will then work on lateral flexion and softening the horse, the problems that they're seeing just magically tend to go away. So 
a snaffle is not really going to help you very much in terms of what we would think of as self-carriage. In other words, the horse finding the bit or the hackamore's neutral position and staying there and honoring it. Because a snaffle really doesn't have that sort of a position. When we start to take up the reins and make contact, then we can set that position and the horse will honor it. If we overdo that, then we will wind up with a horse that is what's called behind the bit. And they're actually evading bit pressure rather than following or being guided by bit pressure. And that's a, that's a problem. Uh, those horses are quite difficult to fix if you take that lesson to that extreme. If I were to try to work on something like self-carriage or headset or something with a horse, I would take a little different approach with it. And we're talking here about a Western horse that I'm trying to to get them in a, spe a certain style of head position, but I don't want to hold them in that head position. So there's, there's no contact involved. It would simply be riding the horse forward, putting them in that head position, letting them go. They immediately fall out of that head position, go somewhere I don't want them to. I pick the reins back up, bring them back to that position, let them go. They fall back out. This repeats a thousand and five times. On the thousand and sixth time, the horse holds the head position for a second. And then I have to put them back in it. Eventually, they go from holding it for a second to two seconds to three seconds to five seconds to 15 seconds and so on. And then they have sort of found the position where I leave them alone. And that is how you would go about, quote unquote, balancing a horse in the snaffle. Now, is it more complicated than that? It, it, it definitely is. Uh, all I'm describing there is how we would be using our hands because you're asking a bit question. The hands are 25% of that equation and 75% of that equation is what your body and your legs are doing to ride the horse forward. And that's one of those things that uh, is very difficult to explain to a novice. Once you feel it and you understand it, the light bulb will go off and it'll all make sense. But articulating how that works is is quite difficult. So, with regard to hackamores and snaffles and balance, I hope that answers that question. So, we had another question from the Facebook group, Bits, Spurs, and Good Sense. And if you're listening to the podcast and you do Facebook and you haven't joined that group, please go find it, Bits, Spurs, and Good Sense. I'll put a link in the show notes. Uh, that is where I do most of my Q&A stuff and where I get the questions and ideas for topics for these Q&A podcasts. So, Steve writes, Daniel, what is your take on Janet Jones's PhD, Janet Jones' PhD's book, Horse Brain, Human Brain? I had a friend's copy in my hand and perused it for a minute and was impressed that it covered a good deal of uh, psychology and ordered it last night. After ordering, of course, I read a review that was rather negative on the positive reinforcement theory being espoused as fact. I'll know more when I read it, but I'm, inex I'm inexperienced enough to be leery of any training that doesn't instill trust and respect based on, well, trust and respect. I'm new, but have paid enough attention locally to see a mare we were close to get trained with treats and love, get sour and disrespectful once she knew the owner was essentially her crack dealer. Okay, so to the first point, I I am unfamiliar with Miss Janet Jones' PhD. I am unfamiliar with her book, so I can't really comment on that book. I did go and read some of the reviews, and it you know it seemed like it was. I guess the impression I got was that it was a fairly basic book, and maybe she didn't get real deep into some things, but you know it was a cursory, cursory explanation. One of the things here that he says is about read a review that was rather negative on the positive reinforcement theory being espoused as fact. Okay, that was the part of this that really made this a question I decided to tackle. I'm also going to link here to a YouTube video that I did on this this topic. So Pavlov really kicked this off. Um, that was at the the turn of the 19th century, the 1890s, he actually won the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine in 1904. Pavlov's area of study was digestion in dogs, believe it or not. So the psychological ramifications of what he discovered 
uh, was a totally unintended consequence. Uh, a lot of scientific discoveries work that way, don't they? Uh, penicillin discovered the same way. Anyway, that kicked off what we now term as associative learning. And associative learning is a big umbrella with sort of multiple small buildings underneath it. One of those is Pavlov's branch, which is called classical conditioning. Classical conditioning, well, I talked about it enough in the video. I guess I don't need to re-explain it. Please go watch that video if you want the technical side of it. So that was the, the classical experiment that, that kicked all of this stuff off when the dog started pairing the bell or buzzer that indicated the door was being opening with being fed, and they started the involuntary response of salivation. That is classical conditioning. It very often mostly uh, involves an involuntary response. Okay, so so the salivation of the dogs was not, uh, you know, you can't make yourself salivate, you can't make yourself not salivate. It's not under voluntary control. A lot of fear-based things go into this, this realm as well. So the Russians did an experiment that's very famous with a young boy named Peter where they, they put him in a room with a white rabbit. And any time the rabbit approached him, he would get a shock. And they did this repetitiously to the point that any time he even saw the rabbit, he would lose, you know, he would urinate on himself, defecate. He, he lost total control, absolute panic, fear, crying, meltdown. So they basically trained a fear into this child. When he grew to be an adult, because we're dealing with subconscious and involuntary things deep in the brain, we often don't have very much control over what occurs there. We have unintended consequences. So this guy grows to be a man. He goes outside. He sees a white fluffy cloud. Meltdown. Reminds him of white fluffy rabbit. Cotton candy. Meltdown. Reminds him of white fluffy rabbit. They ruined his life. I mean, you know, this, this was this was not what we would consider a moral or ethical experiment. But Again, that's the realm of classical conditioning. Positive reinforcement falls into a different model. Uh, B.F. Skinner is given the credit for developing it, but it is what's called operant conditioning or quadrant conditioning. Because if you, if you took a square and you drew sort of a plus in the middle of it where you have four boxes, you have positive and negative on one axis and you have reinforcement and punishment on the other. You have positive reinforcement and positive punishment negative reinforcement and negative punishment. In this context, positive simply means something is added. Negative simply means something is taken away. It has nothing to do with good and bad, nice and kind, mean, nothing like that. Punishment, again, simply means to make a behavior less likely to reoccur. Reinforcement means to make a behavior more likely to reoccur. Okay, so that's that's all that it is. And there is actually a fifth quadrant called extinction, which is basically where you change timing up and you make things random so that you make a cue go away. We use all of these very commonly in animal training and even, even dealing with people today. The least common used one is negative punishment. An example of that would be your child gets bad grades and you take their phone away. So you are punishing them to make a behavior of bad grades, not studying, not putting enough effort in, less likely to reoccur punishment by removing something that they want, the phone or grounding them or whatever. We can use that with humans. Jail essentially works that way. We take their freedom away for bad behavior to punish um, but this is a, a very abstract concept, and animals are not going to get it. So one of the bad applications that we'll see referred to there regularly is, let's say that I'm riding this horse today, and he had a really bad day. He was disrespectful. He was mean. He bucked. He did whatever. And so I rode the snot out of him, and now he's going to go get tied to the patient's pole, and he's going to spend three hours thinking about his bad decision an hour ago at the start of this ride. Well, there's not an animal on the planet. Elephants, birds, I mean, you, you pick the smartest ones you want. 
they're not going to be capable of linking those two things together. The hours on the patient's poll with bucking an hour ago. So we don't use negative punishment in the realm of training animals, or at least if we actually understand training, we don't, because they're never going to make the association there. So positive reinforcement theory. Yes, all of this is technically a theory. Okay. What, what they really are, what classical conditioning and, and operant conditioning, what they really are is simply organizational structures that sort of give us boundaries and definitions so that we can better organize and understand this topic. It's a way of explaining how it works. So technically it is a theory, yes. So is gravity. Technically so are numbers. We cannot prove that numbers actually exist but we can replicate enough times that one plus one equals two to go with the assumption that it's a good theory. Operant conditioning has been around since the 1940s, uh, classical conditioning and Pavlov stuff since the early 1900s. So we're talking about things that are 70 to 100, 110 years old. They have been proven and replicated so many times. It is very safe to say that things do in fact work that way. So one of the things I have a problem with, we, we start hearing people saying things like, oh, that's been debunked now. Well, no, <laughs> no, it hasn't. When you have thousands of studies and thousands, tens of thousands, if not millions of animals that have been subjected to a particular methodology of training and it has worked repetitiously for decades and decades and decades a single scientific study coming along in no way debunks or disproves something we have that much evidence based upon what does tend to happen is people do studies on a very very particular corner of it and tweak a little something and they may improve something a little bit one way or or, or further define something in another way or we make a discovery about this particular animal and how it learns in a specific environment. And so the, the changes and the things that we're adding to and taking away from and, and learning here are, are fairly minuscule in nature. Um, there's no way you're ever going to disprove that positive reinforcement works because in, there's tons of evidence that it does. And this is sort of where we start to get these terms of evidence-based. Evidence-based practice is a conscientious problem-solving approach to clinical practice that incorporates the best evidence from well-designed studies, patient values, and preferences, and a clinician's expertise in making decisions about a patient's care. So, it takes the, the practitioner's clinical experiments, experience. It takes the information that we know about this specific patient, and it takes into account the best scientific evidence um, and then where all those lines cross in a Venn diagram is where we have evidence-based practice. There's a lot of science going on right now and there are many many studies and everybody is trying to move the ball down the field and maybe get a little glory for themselves in the process and it's very easy to hand pick a particular study that you might find or it's easy to follow someone who handpicks a study that backs up a theory that they have and use that theory or that study as evidence. That's not really the scientific process, though. Um, that is more evidence of confirmation bias. So I thought we would just talk about science and the scientific method for just a second. So this is what all research should be modeled after. First, we ask a question that we are looking for an answer to. Then we perform research. We try to become educated on this question and the answer. Through that research, we establish a hypothesis. We decide that if we were to do this and change these variables, that the outcome should be that. We then test the hypothesis through conducting experimentation. Then we make an observation of the data of the experimentation. What are the results here? 
Then we analyze those results and draw a conclusion. Did my hypothesis at the beginning come to fruition? Did it go the way I thought it would? Does the data support that? Did it change it as much as I thought it would? Did it change it less? Did it change it more? And we use mathematical, the, the field of mathematics is called statistics, to break all of that down. Um, and then the last step of that is to present the findings. That's a very important part of it. Usually we're going to be publishing science that we're proud of and that we think is sound and has uh, broken new ground. And then it is up to the peers, the fellow scientists, to review our research and to decide whether our methodology was sound or flawed. And then others may pick up that same experiment and replicate it. And that is an important part because if, let's say, we do this experiment in Arizona and then we do the same experiment in Maryland and again in Washington State and we come up with three different conclusions, um, it's very possible that, that there's a variable in there that is changing our results that we have not accounted for. So the, through repl replication of the experiment, we can discover whether there is something missing here we haven't accounted for that is affecting our outcome. So this is where we have problems with these single research papers. They have not been replicated. They haven't necessarily been peer-reviewed. It's, it's sort of the one point does not make a straight line. A couple of things that I wanted to talk about here, like the background of that. Um, I, I was fortunate to be on in a school that was very science-based. I graduated from Louisiana Tech. The academic path and research or becoming a veterinarian or, or whatever, these were doors that were open to me had I chosen to walk through them. Uh, I chose not to, and uh, I stuck with training horses instead. I felt like that was my calling. Um, but you know, my, my friends and peers in classes, or most of them are called doctor now. So a little of what I learned through the, through the process of having those friends and peers. Your field of research is a whole lot less up to you than you might think that it is. So, so what do I mean by that? I had one particular friend whose, um, their area of study was, was plants, plant biology, and their particular niche what they were very interested in and wanted to do for the rest of their life was breeding rare orchids it came time for them to get a master's and breeding rare orchids is a very expensive proposition and there were no grants available for that to fund that sort of research and so they started having to well what what is available what's an option you want to know what the option was there was someone who was doing ichthyology research specifically on farm-raised catfish and algae that were causing off flavors in the, the catfish. And they needed someone to study the algae who understood how plants and things work. And this particular grad student was the only one around with a plant-based background. And thus, they went into research in algae causing off flavors in catfish and far as I know, I've lost touch, but 25, 30 years later, that's still what they're doing. Pretty far cry from rare orchids, wouldn't you say? <laughs> Another friend of mine wanted to get into vet school, would have made an excellent candidate, did not quite make it, and then went on into the more academic side of things, working on a master's. The, the project that was fundable and was open to her was studying parasites in sheep so she had to grow a pen of sheep out parasites are very bad in louisiana she had to start with like 190 sheep or something in order to be assured that at the time for them to do the research they would have 70 available for slaughter and this young lady had never dealt with sheep they weren't part of her repertoire they weren't part of her interest but she had a degree in animal science she wanted to be involved in animal science what was available her was to study parasites in sheep. This is very often the way that it works. You, you don't necessarily get to follow the path that you want. You, you only follow what there are grants available for and what's, what's actually out there. And then you wind up, maybe you want to go get a PhD. Well, you've already got a paper published 
in this, that's what they're going to tend to want to give you a scholarship for, and, and you wind up the rest of your life algae and catfish or parasites and sheep just because that was the place and time you were at. Another aspect of this, there, there's a book that I read a while back just as I, I have an interest in birds as well. I think I've talked a little bit about falconry and my grandfather raising birds. So there's a book called Alex and Me, and it follows the the uh, non-traditional journey of Dr. Irene M. Pepperberg and an African gray parrot named Alex. Now, she did some pretty groundbreaking research with this parrot. She went on the Johnny Carson show with him, I believe. Um, she disproved a lot of standing theory and dogma with regard to the cognitive abilities of birds. Her doctorate, PhD, and master's were both in chemistry. She was a chemist. Her husband got a job at a different university. She moved there. There wasn't a place for her in the chemistry department. She's trying to figure something out so that she will have a job here at the university where her husband is. She winds up studying animal behavior. She had no background in birds whatsoever. She did a lot of groundbreaking stuff with birds. As a person with a background in birds, I can tell you that, that she maybe unwittingly um, talks about a few things in the book, that the behaviors that the bird had, feather picking and so forth, that actually indicate stress and, and, and bad things. So if, if a real bird person had walked into her lab and seen the condition of the bird, they might have had the inclination to rescue it. <laughs> Yet, she she took this bird that was overstressed and in, in bad shape in some ways and proved that, that birds were more than mimickers. She proved that, that the bird could could take multiple simple words that it was learning and put those words into phrases and later questions and even answers. So it could be trained to select the green block out of a group of blocks where there was only one green block. So we now know the bird understands what the color green is and so forth. And, and these were things at that point in time that weren't understood. Yet she was very guilty of not really understanding the subject of her research. There's a very famous Dutch primatologist named Franz de Waal, and this is one of his criticisms of modern research, is that you get people who study a subject like primates or horses or dogs, and they themselves have no actual experience with that animal. And that's sort of a double-edged sword. It is good to have someone looking at a subject with fresh eyes and they are not subject to dogma because they haven't been exposed to that. They are not subject to the assumptions that everybody naturally makes. So they have the opportunity with a blank slate to break ground. They also can be kind of dangerous because they are going to come up with data and assumptions and all on a subject they don't really fully understand. I find a lot of research uh, is this way. I would I would really agree with Franz de Waal. So when you read research papers, and we're going to talk about doing that a little bit later, it's sometimes pretty clear from the description and what they were trying to do and the way that they went about it that the person doing it doesn't really understand animals at all or the particular animal they're talking about. Um, I mean, I'm I'm pretty well versed in dogs, birds, and horses. There's a lot of things that go on that, you know, pe people who are well versed in that kind of look at it and they go, oh, they did what? Well, why didn't they do it this way? Why They didn't think this would affect it or whatever. So that's part of the science, the follow the research, the we've debunked this. Well, maybe you didn't <laughs> so much. All right, we're going to, we're going to take a pause. Normally, we do a, a funny sponsor for each episode. This one's going to be a little bit different. I did a, a Facebook post for her, but I had a, a very close friend, really a family member, um, who was a horse lover. We, we did some horse work together. We got her a horse she could call her own, and, and she rode with me a bunch and got to experience some of her 
force milestones and bucket list items ticked off of the list. But um, Karen Doty lost her battle with cancer yesterday morning, and I thought rather than rather than than a funny sponsor, she's uh, she earned a moment of silence. So that's what we're going to do today instead. All right, if y'all are listening to this, um, I, I would certainly take it as a personal favor if you would send prayers or good vibes or whatever your particular belief system is out there for her family. It's definitely difficult to lose a wife and a mom and really, really good friend. Okay, well, I know I'm, I'm a little rambling here. So, so back to the original part of positive reinforcement theory. It is an organizational structure. It's a single tool, a method of teaching an animal to do anything. It's been extensively used in the dog world for decades now. Um, it's newer on the block with horses. My original, and I apologize if I've talked about this already on the podcast. My introduction to this was when I was in college, and it was with a lady that, that had formerly trained animals at SeaWorld. Most of that is is all positive reinforcement, the fish that they're giving these animals and so forth. Um, there's a reason for it. They don't have real contact with these animals. Some of these animals are dangerous. You need to get a toe in the door. And that is through feeding them. One of the things we'll talk a little bit about here is we'll bring the birds in. When B.F. Skinner originally came up with the operant conditioning method, the first portion of it was to a uh, positive reinforcement was to starve the animal down to 80% of their original weight. This is where the motivation comes in. This is still used somewhat today. If you're training wild animals, like I told you part of what I'm involved in or, or starting to be involved in is falconry, you are very much using that animal's weight as a factor of the training. So if, if we go trap a wild hawk today, one of the first things we're going to do is weigh that animal. We're going to take that down a little notebook and we're going to note what its starting weight is. And then tomorrow we're going to get that animal out. We're going to offer it food on the glove. Probably that animal will not eat. We're going to do that again the next day and the next day. And oftentimes it's two to four days before the animal will actually take food from you. It's getting hungrier. It's now more and more motivated and willing to do things it wasn't willing to do before. And positive reinforcement is the sole training tool for falconry. Um, and if you continue to work that bird long enough, they get full and they won't fly to you anymore. So you have to be aware of the weight of the animal, the weight that it flies well at, what too fat is, and how much you fed it today. <laughs> and you can feed them too much and can't retrieve your bird, and they're going to spend the night in a tree, and hopefully an owl doesn't kill them, and then you're going to have to go back the next morning and, and try to lure them down with food again. And I say this because any training we're doing with food has that Achilles heel. I think this is what causes doubt in some of your more old-time cowboy types that will continually tell you that food is not a true reward. And as I've already said, with falcons and all, they have a flying weight that they fly at. If they're too fat, they don't come back or they don't hunt. One of the things that we understand with horses, we talk a lot about the thinking state versus the emotional state. You're always trying to get a horse to come back to or to stay in their thinking brain. Well, that, that's an actual physiological switch. We have the limbic system in there, which is sort of the emotional center a more primitive part of the brain beyond conscious control. When an animal goes into the parasympathetic nervous system, that's that's where the thinking brain is. So heart rate is down, uh, respiration is normal. They're not going to have an adrenaline spike. The digestion is taking place. 
when they swap to the sympathetic nervous system, this is where fight or flight resides. This is when they're going to be hyper reactive, hypersensitive in a bad way. And one of the things that occurs there, so I just talked about heart rate in the sympathetic nervous system, heart rate increases, respiration increases, you kind of pant, you breathe shorter and faster, and digestion stops. Okay, so that's one of the first things that we have when we when we have that that switch. This is actually how we know that licking and chewing is a good thing and that it, it correlates with the dopamine release. When a horse transitions from the sympathetic nervous system back into the parasympathetic nervous system, I believe it's the ninth cervical nerve, kicks back in and the animal immediately begins to salivate again. And because it salivates, we see the lick and chew. That's the return of the digestive system, which signals return to parasympathetic nervous system. So if we know that an animal that goes into the sympathetic nervous system, digestion ends, does food remain a motivator in that state? Now, I'll be be fair and honest here. Hopefully, we'll, what we're accomplishing as we're training a horse, we're making them more and more confident, more and more comfortable. They're staying in the thinking brain and they do not have panic modes, fight or flights and all of that. But, you know, let's just be honest with practical experience. That always remains a possibility with, with any horse. There's, there's going to be something at some time that's going to happen. That's just catches them by surprise more than they can handle. Boom. If you are a positive reinforcement purist, do you think that your cues remain valid in that moment? Are you going to still have control of the animal? Or are they still going to honor those cues? I honestly don't know the answer. Uh, I don't feel like it's likely to be a black and white answer. It's going to be some shade of gray. But I do know that in those instances, pressure and release still has an application and I still have a physical touch bond with the animal. Uh, I can pull on a rein, I can pull on a rope, I can do whatever. All things that positive reinforcement people, the purists, wouldn't have available to them. This also brings, I, I was trying to draw this out a little bit more in the interview with Dr. Robert M. Miller. There were a few people uh, in the Facebook post on that on our group that commented that imprinting had been debunked or that he had taken it too far or whatever. So once again, the context. Uh, imprinting has not and cannot be quote-unquote debunked. It can be added to, it can be understood a little further, but once again, it's an evidence-based practice. If you, you get involved with any animal, domesticated or wild, at birth, and you're there in their face feeding them for days thereafter, they are going to imprint on you. You can, through experimentation, even have them imprint onto inanimate objects. Dr. Miller had talked about that, that they had a foal that imprinted on a tree. They had another one that imprinted on a wheelbarrow. Imprinting, again, is is something that occurs deep in the brain, in the subconscious, involuntary realms. And that is, again, sort of like classical conditioning. It's where we can have unintended and unexpected consequences form. Like I happen to play with this foal and feed him every day near this wheelbarrow and they associated the wheelbarrow with this and they then would follow the wheelbarrow all over the place like it was their mother. That's why foals follow the mother. They imprint on them. Um, zebras have specific patterns and the mama zebra will circle the baby over and over and over both directions. The baby will memorize the pattern of its specific mom, and that's how it can pick it out of a herd of a thousand zebras. That is imprinting. When my grandfather was raising parrots, this was part of our daily routine. Every day when we were too young for school, we went to their house while our parents worked. So did my other cousins. Every day after school, we went to their house. The bus dropped us off there. We were there for several hours. Um, at some point, it became our jobs to help feed the birds and, and all of those things. So you take a young parrot out of the nest, you do what's called hand raising it. The value of it goes way, way up. It goes up because that baby becomes imprinted on people. It bonds to people in a way that is not really natural. And it, it, it then 
doesn't really think it's a person, but, you know, people are a normal part of their space. They become abnormally comfortable with people. This is, if you're going to buy a big parent and you want to talk to it and have a cool relationship with it, you want a hand-raised parrot. You do not want a parent-raised parrot. That one is going to be a lot more flighty, a lot more difficult to form a relationship with. The depth of the relationship you can form with it will be probably never as deep as what you can form with a hand-raised bird. It just makes things a lot more difficult. This would be like getting a Mustang. Can you form a great relationship with a Mustang? Yes. Is that going to be easy? Hell no. Is that going to be something everyone is skilled enough and capable enough to do? Hell no. Okay, you hear me? Hell no. Not even close. Not kind of, sort of, not even a little bit. Uh, Here's one of the things I'll tell you about Mustangs. They recruit trainers for those Mustang makeover deals. I've been approached multiple times for it. I have some moral objections to some of the things that the BLM does, some of the ways that they approach this stuff. For instance, using very skilled trainers to make Mustangs look like they are for everyone and they can be tamed and gentled and amazing things can be done if if you are not the top one percent of cult starters you don't have any damn business around a mustang and that's not one of those things they announce over a loudspeaker or put in a magazine ad so i don't really find that i mean it's it's just like misrepresenting a horse when you're off to sell it I don't think that's really the way Mustangs need to be represented. Do I think all the Mustangs need to be killed? I don't. No, I'm not against Mustangs. But I don't think that adopt a Mustang into Joe Blow, who's never had a horse's backyard, is a good thing either. Okay? I mean, that's that can be a recipe for disaster. One other thing I wanted to add specifically with regard to Dr. Miller and the, the quote-unquote debunking of his theories in attachment, conditioning, and imprinting. There are people that critique him and say that that what he was going about doing, the methodology, was highly invasive. And it, it is to a degree. I mean, he's putting fingers inside ears, even the anus. Keep in mind, though, context, like we've talked about with the research. He was a veterinarian. That whole deal was derived as a veterinarian, a working, practicing veterinarian. And as he said in his interview, he wasn't even charging people to do it initially. In his mind, he was investing in a future customer that was going to be easier to work on for the next 20 or 30 years of its life. That's why he was doing the imprinting. And when you think about the things that a veterinarian has to do to an animal, They're invasive by nature. They're going to put a a thermometer up a horse's blood and temp it. And they're going to have to do things in the ears, do things in the mouth, um, dental work and and so forth, handle the feet when there are abscesses and things are painful. And and so that that to me is an obvious uh, reason for the invasive nature of what he was doing. Does it mean that if you're going to imprint your own foal, you have to do all of those things? No. Does it mean that doing those things would be harmful in some way? No. I mean, it's it's all context. It, it's obvious why he was taking that to the degree that he was. It's because he was a veterinarian, and those are the things he was going to have trouble with down the road in the course of his work with that animal as a veterinarian. Context is important. Uh, another thing that, that we'll hear talked about, this was brought up in the Facebook group, is join-up. The join-up has been debunked well i mean what is join up or are we i I generally try not to discuss other clinicians and all in specifics about them but i I mean I, i can't do it without mentioning the name here so join up is a trademark phrase trademarked by monty roberts you may have feelings positive or 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 negative toward him that's not really what i'm discussing right now what I'm discussing is is that that phrase is his phrase, and, and I guess technically he now, because the way laws work, he gets to define it. If we're talking about getting in a round pin with a horse and 
getting it where it is less scared of you and starts to see you as a leader and starts to follow you around and, and looks to you for guidance, then that has not been debunked. It also wasn't the original idea of Monty Roberts. I mean, there, there are multiple others that have done stuff like that, Tom Dorrance being the, the most notable prior to him. It's just the way that legalities and copyrights and trademarks work. He took advantage of it and marketed it and made a reputation off of it. Therefore, debunking it, no. I mean, there, there's plenty of evidence of the, how that works. You can decide whether you like that effect in your horse or not, and that's up to you. It doesn't mean that the general premise of it, the practice of it, or the theory behind it isn't valid. It, it certainly is. There is now a phrase going through about leadership, that all this leadership stuff, these these big hat cowboys keep talking about in their natural horsemanship demos has been debunked. Well, once again, no, it hasn't. <laughs> I have looked for the root of this a, a, a fair bit. I haven't found a lot on it. One of the things that I have found, I think I've seen it referenced two or three times, is about a study with wolves. Once again, this is how research works, okay? So there was a study done in like the 1930s with a not fully wild, I don't know the, the correct term, we couldn't call them domesticated really, but, but maybe a feral pack of wolves. So wolves raised in captivity, and it was done on the leadership structure within that wolf pack and within the confines of, I guess, what we would essentially call a zoo or maybe a preserve or something like that. So, again, with the, within the confines of research, significant changes to the natural environment. And that has what specifically has been debunked. That study has been relooked at, and the problems with the methodology and the conclusions have been pointed out and then a very, very broad brush has painted all leadership research to be, quote unquote, debunked. Well, no. <laughs> leadership within animals absolutely exists. Hierarchies exist. They exist within wolf packs. The fact that a specific wolf pack that was studied the hierarchies within it were artificially altered by people doesn't mean that leadership doesn't exist. Pecking order is evident among multitudes of species. It also doesn't mean that we can take a predatory species like a wolf and completely take pack mentality and transfer what we learn there over to horses. Horses are prey animals. They have herd mentality. Predator and prey is a very big fork in the road. And the way that horses respond in herds is not the same way that wolves respond in packs. So, you, you, you know, the word debunk is just not an appropriate word to use there. If I hear someone saying things like that, I'm now going to be pretty leery of that person. They are either trying to handpick research to back up their own theories, and they're trying to manipulate me in some way, probably for their own benefit or their own notoriety, or they just flat out don't know or understand what the hell they're talking about. And anytime I'm recognizing those sorts of options in front of me, this is now someone I'm, I have lost trust for. Um, this is one of the big reasons why we did the bit video, because there are a few horse companies, one in particular that comes to mind over and over, that put out misinformation. And I know the information they put out to be false. It's 90% true. Then it's got that twist in it, that other thing that they say. And now they have a design that fixes this problem. And that problem, namely like the nutcracker effect, I can absolutely prove to you that that doesn't exist. It does not work the way they claim that it works. Now, the design they came up with is a functional design. The marketing that they're using to sell it 
is fraudulent, however. I have an objection to that. And, and again, my view on that is that they either don't know better and they should, or they do know better and they're manipulating you anyway. I don't really see a third option. So, science and marketing, they're bedfellows. Um, this is one of those things that exists in every aspect of what we now call science. Big Pharma, the climatized science grants, all that stuff. I'm not trying to get political here, but, I mean, there's definitely data in all of these areas that goes both ways, and a lot of evidence that they tend to handpick the data they prefer and present that. But if you go looking for it, you can find the data that they didn't like that refuted their claims, but they just didn't show it to you. It's the way that it works. There's tons of drugs out there that had multi millions, maybe billions of dollars of research, came to market, went through, and 10 years later, it's pulled off of the market because it was causing problems that we didn't see and so forth. It happens all the time. So be careful with what, quote unquote, the science is. Uh, again, Alex and me, nothing against Dr. Pepperberg. She proved some really cool things with that bird, cognitive abilities we did not know existed prior. She was viewed as a heretic, yet through many of the things that she says in her research and alludes to, it's very clear that that bird was not being, not living its best life. It was sort of a victim of research, and it had the behaviors that we know indicate overstress, overstimulation, and, and an animal that's in a bad way. So, okay. Uh, the other thing I, I forgot about, or I meant to mention when I was talking about join up, the what supposedly debunked join up was the race car deal, where they put a remote control car in a round pin with a horse, and they started moving the horse around out of fear with the car, and they eventually, through timing and on off switching and so forth, just like we would do if we were standing in a round pin, they got the animal to quote-unquote join up with the car and this then debunks the human influence it it doesn't it means that the tool was used in place of the human that had a similar effect humans use tools like it, it would be the same thing if i were to say that me and a round pin with a flag um the same result was achieved with me and a round pin with a rope and thus the flag is invalid. It, it's not. It's, it's same effect, different tool. That's all that it really is. That kind of ties back in with the positive reinforcement. Uh, we've got another question here. Oh boy, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm so scatterbrained on this stuff. But the, the original question, I didn't finish answering. That was about the positive reinforcement and Janet Jones's uh, PhD's book, Horse Brain, Human Brain. Again, I don't, I'm not familiar with this book, and I do not know the, the lady at all. I looked her up a little bit. I'm, I'm, I'm sure she's a perfectly fine person and all. I'm just not familiar with her book. I will plug a book called Horsehead, Brain Science and Other Insights. It is by Maddie Butcher and Dr. Steve Peters. I know both of them. I haven't met Dr. Peters. I've only corresponded with him. Maddie and I, I would consider to be pretty good friends at this point. This is a book I'm not quite finished with, but very good book, very easy to read, and I know Maddie and her thoroughness on research, and, and I would trust anything that is in that book. So I'll, if you're interested in horse brain neuroscience type activity, polyvagal nerve theory, um, those sorts of things, I don't think you could do a whole lot better than horse head. So the positive reinforcement thing that you alluded to, uh, you said you're new enough to pay attention and you saw that basically an animal got sour and disrespectful and came to view the owner as their crack dealer. Positive reinforcement generally has a stage involved in it called mugging. And this is what you're describing. That's when the animal learns that you have the treats and they try to get treats from you without doing the work and, and they tend to become disrespectful, pushy. This is, this is kind of a dangerous or can be uh, stage. It is, however, just a stage. Proper application of positive reinforcement moves beyond this rather quickly. 
improper application of positive reinforcement can make this stage last a long time and can turn animals flat out dangerous. What I predominantly use, what all horsemen predominantly use, is negative reinforcement. And this is pressure and release. Contact with your leg to move the horse over, pick up on this rein, affect the bit, the horse turns left. All of that is negative reinforcement in nature. And it it's really suits its lends itself to horsemanship because we very often are in contact with the animal in some way. We have a physical touch. Thus, we can push harder, we can lighten up. Feel. The very concept of feel is in the realm of negative reinforcement. Positive reinforcement I have used somewhat. I've said this a bunch of times, but the only version of it that I find to be beneficial is essentially clicker training. Now, I don't actually use a clicker for the most part when I'm doing this. So a few years ago on a, a forum, there was somebody that had pointed out to me that my argument on the impracticality of holding a clicker in my hand or my mouth was kind of null and void because all I really needed was a bridging signal. And I knew that, but they kind of connected a couple dots for me and made the obvious obvious to me. And <clears throat> so what I use typically instead of a clicker is the word there. So all you're really trying to do with the bridging signal, which, which typically is a clicker, is mark the spot. And that allows for you to have excellent timing once they understand what the click or bridging signal or whatever is. So a horse does the action that I want. I say there, and if I'm feeding a treat or whatever, I then reinforce there with the treat. But there allows me to mark the spot. I simply came across with that because I, uh, that's exactly how I mark the spot for riders when I'm doing lessons. I'm, I'm marking that spot. Oh, that was what happened. And there, there we go. Okay, that was it. Did you feel that? And so I just transitioned that into the horse. When I use positive reinforcement, I tend to use it with broncs. Horses that are either very sour towards people or very fearful towards people. I don't use it a ton. I, I'm uh, Full disclosure, I'm not extremely experienced with it. I tend to use it with horses, and I always want to know that I've got at least 90 days to deal with this animal. I don't find this approach to be super fast, or at least what I'm trying to get out of it. I am trying to use it to alter what is, and I'm going to be very careful with my words here. I use positive reinforcement, addition of something, in order to make a behavior more likely to reoccur. When I have an animal whose overall view of me or of people in general is unpleasant, they have a bad taste in their mouth, they are very mistrustful or fearful. That's when I pull out the tool of positive reinforcement. I don't always use it. I certainly think it can be done without. It's just a tool. What I find is that I can influence the animal over time where they no longer have an unpleasant association with me or with people. Okay, now notice I said unpleasant and not positive. That's where we get really difficult here is when people use words positive and negative to mean good and bad instead of the, the true technical definitions of them of addition and removal. I don't really use the clicker all that much, though. I'll use it initially, and if I'm doing some forms of groundwork, I don't stick with it, though. What I wind up doing, I first pair with the stimulus. So this is where we actually bring classical conditioning in. I, I feed the horse, typically not out of my hand. When I feed them, I want them to be hungry. And I feed them something they like, and I stand there beside them. And when they stick their head in the bucket to eat, I click. And I do this for a day or two or three. That Pavlov thing, right? The salivation with the bell. So we associate it. This is called loading the clicker. 
And when I feel like there is a strong association with the click, I will then start working the animal and asking it to do very simple, possibly completely inane things. It could be I stand outside the stall with a really bad one. I wave the flag and I'm just trying to get him to go to a certain corner of the stall and stop. And then when they do that, I click and I back away and they come forward and they can eat out of the bucket. That that could be with a really bad one, a Mustang, something like that. That could be the start. And all I'm really trying to do is get the big picture idea in there that I'm going to ask you something. And if you comply, you're going to get what you want. That's the sole big picture relationship I'm trying to initiate right there. That they learn that there's a question and an answer here. I'm then going to change the question and the answer. Maybe now they go to a different corner of the stall. Maybe now I ask them to move. Maybe now I ask them to stop. It really doesn't matter what it is. I, I can look for things that are going to be practical and useful later on, but they really don't have to be. All I'm trying to do is to get the pleasant association with me and the horse to understand that there is a question and an answer. And once they start looking for answers, then I'm typically going to morph to negative reinforcement with some liberty things, with uh, some trick training stuff, then positive reinforcement really does still make sense. It tends to get a very gung-ho animal that is fairly motivated. If I were training a horse to do something cool for a commercial or something like that, probably I would use positive reinforcement. It depends on specifically what, what I needed to demonstrate, but that would be a good method. Where do I have issue with it? First of all, again, operant conditioning is an organizational structure. It is meant to be looked at analytically. What happens is that people come in with an emotional thought, a feeling, and they assign that one of these is better than the other. Well, that's not scientific, first of all. <laughs> they, they all get results. They all have evidence. Better and worse is more a moral decision, and science is amoral. All right? It's also just a tool. Again, negative reinforcement has tons of evidence for it. It's definitely not a pathway to a sour horse. Just as I don't want to look at positive reinforcement and see someone attempting to do that, but doing it poorly, and they're getting mugged, and they're in that, that situation where they're a vending machine, that is not a fair representation of what positive reinforcement is supposed to be. And I don't want to judge a, a methodology on a bad representation of that methodology. Okay. When when the bits are bad, people are saying things like bits cause pain and da 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 da, da. And I could Google and, and look at tons of pictures on the internet that would back that up. That's confirmation bias. And it is trying to prove something by using the worst examples of it. Okay? So I don't appreciate when people say bits are bad and use a picture of a bit used improperly. To back that up, I'm not going to rake positive reinforcement over the coals by someone who's green and is using it improperly and coming up with a bad result. That's just not a fair, it's definitely not a scientific way to do it, is it? I guess the problem I have with it is that very commonly the people who espouse positive reinforcement as the way to go are really down on negative reinforcement in the process. So they're guilty of what I was just talking about, picking bad examples of, of a methodology done poorly and, and with a broad brush painting over the entire methodology as flawed because they saw it done poorly. Uh, my example that I always use with that, with, with bits or spurs or whatever, is that I can take a brick. A brick is an amoral object. It is inanimate. It is neither capable of good or evil. Okay? It does not have morals. It is up to the influencer. I can take the brick and I can build a school, a church, a hospital, a house, whatever. Good things. All positive or pleasant associations, right? I can take the same brick and I can bash in someone's brains and murder them. Neither outcome is the fault of the brick. All right? So I can take a big bit. I can misuse it. I can cause pain. I can sour a horse. 
I can take a bit. I can communicate good things to a horse. I can have them understand what's going on. I can train them very well, and they're very happy and a good partner for me. Neither outcome is the fault of the bit, right? Same thing with positive reinforcement. Uh, the, the problem I have with it, again, is, is the people that tend to espouse it, either they're down on negative reinforcement. I don't think most of them understand that the negative part isn't a bad thing or, or a cruel thing. It's, it's simply the removal of pressure. And, and B, they tend to be purists about it. And I'm never a real fan of a purist. I think being a purist is fine for research type purposes and learning specifically what this one variable does do. But in terms of actually training a horse, I would never want to ignore tools in my toolbox. I spent years and years and years becoming skilled with these different tools. To me, if I'm really out to do what's best for the horse, then me making a decision that I'm not going to use these eight tools anymore, that's an egotistical decision or one of vanity. It's not a decision made in what's best for the horse. And thus, I don't want to be guilty of it. So I try not to be a purist in anything I do. I'm more of an experimenter. I'm happy to try different things and go different ways and see what they do and always be improving and learning and striving to do better and come up with a better outcome. Hopefully in 10 years, my point of view is different. Hopefully I've learned some things. Hopefully I have more experience and better information to go off of. That's what I'm shooting for anyway. All right. Science again. So I talked a little bit about this. If you are interested in reading some of this research, some of the, the outlets that you can try, one would be your public library. It probably actually does have or have access to some of these different behavioral journals or medical journals or psychological journals or whatever they are. If not, if you have access to a college library, particularly some of them, uh, I know at Louisiana Tech, I forget exactly what the designation was, but it was a special kind of library. Maybe it had government stuff. I don't remember, but, but it, it had more information than, than a typical collegiate library. And you could find any dang thing you wanted to in the world if you knew how to look. Ask for help. If you go to a library, those people are just dying to be useful. So ask them for help and they will point you in the right direction. If you don't want to go to a library... There is a program, or program's not the right word. What is the right word? Um, it's Google Scholar. So Google is your look for anything and everything browser. If you will go into Google and look up Google Scholar, it will swap you over to Google Scholar when you click on the link. Google Scholar is a database solely for research. Okay, and you can find all kind of stuff through that thing. Um, once again, I would hope you remember some of the criteria. Look up what the scientific method is. Make sure it was followed. Make sure that to the best of your ability that data wasn't excluded or included or altered because that stuff happens more than you think. And make sure that it became peer-reviewed. If it was peer-reviewed, Try to look up what the reviews were and what the criticisms or um, attaboys were with regard to that topic. And look for corroborating repeat, repeated research. Did other people do this same experiment and come up with the same conclusion and the same data backing it up? And look at the data. So every, every one of these uh, research projects has what's called an abstract, and that's going to be kind of like the summary. And usually it's maybe a page long. The total research project could be 30 pages, could be 90 pages. And it's usually going to be full of technical jargon. They are going out of their way to make those things as complicated and difficult to read as possible. You may or may not have to look up some words, and that's no shame if you do. I still have to look up words all the time or, or reminders because again they get very specific so if I'm not a hundred percent sure of exactly the technical definition of this word I'm going to look it up to make sure that that we're on the same page here and then look at the data because sometimes they're going to go through a lot of your time to find that this thing that they tried made a 0.34 percent 
change in 16% of the people that they applied it to or horses or dogs or whatever. So it may just be a gigantic waste of your time to finish reading that article. So those would be a few things. Libraries, Google Scholar. I have had pretty decent research. I know y'all aren't necessarily in the same professional camp that I'm in, but I have had pretty decent luck emailing and calling and reaching out to some of the college professors who the researchers were and so forth. I would say maybe 70% of the time they they email me back or call me back and, and we can chat about it or whatever and sort of get, you know, I can read their tone on the phone and that sort of thing and and and, and look for the And I'm always also looking for the corroborating evidence. So, for instance, uh, with regard to this horse head stuff, I've been on the track of dopamine and some of its effects for several years. There is a, a deal I found very exciting on the part of the brain called the striatum and the way that it affect, is affected by dopamine. And I am dying to tell you all about it. I can find no corroborating evidence yet that backs it up. It's a one-off study as far as I can tell. And I'm not willing to put that out there as being valid yet until I can corroborate it from other sources. So that's how science is supposed to be. We're supposed to hold the phone a little bit. We're supposed to make sure that it's good and we're supposed to look at it and make sure that that uh, it makes sense because all this stuff can be manipulated. You know, it can be phrased, it can be spun, it can be made to look this way or that way when if you really read the paper, that isn't what it says at all. So be careful of the research and the science particularly the word debunked. Just about every time you come across that word, you better look deeper because you probably are being manipulated. All right, enough rambling. Sorry, this one was a little confused. Like I'll say, with, uh, with uh, Karen's deal and all, the last couple of days have been a little little rough and my brain is a little foggy and, and all of that. But anyway, all right. If you're on one of the podcasting directories that allows for ratings and reviews and comments, we would certainly welcome that and um, share this with a friend. We're, we're trying to grow it. It is growing, but we certainly are trying to grow it even more. Also, if you do like this stuff and the way I talk, I'm very approachable. Reach out to me through my email, which is daniel at dolphinhorsemanship.com or a Facebook message or something like that. I will get back to you personally. It will not be a secretary or or uh, something like that. And uh, we can talk about having a clinic in your area or something after COVID. All of that has been just, you know, the, the world is, has changed. So we're looking for, for new venues and, and new clinic hosts and all and get back out there on the road and start doing more and more clinics. So if you might be interested in that, please contact me. We would love to have one in your area. All right. Talk to you all next week. Thanks for listening. <laughs> We'll see you next week for another episode of Adult Onset Horsemanship. I've been your host, Daniel Dolphin. <laughs>